The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello? And we primarily do this by providing information, advice, training, and of course the other one is just One of the reasons that we're so strong at this is that we're also interested by the six partners who are led by the China Big Business Council, and then there's the British members, the Ben Cham, the Lord Trump, the Canyon Council. webinars as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions with the webinars, you can ask them in your control panel, which is the control panel. Just a question about production by Erica. Hello everybody, can everybody hear me now? Okay, that's great. So I've just given an introduction to the center and uh, some of the, the background of the presentation today. But before we go on, I just wanted to go through some of the common questions that are asked uh, of the US SME Center about um, accessing finance and accessing um, investment in China. And some of the key questions are, are very practical. 
Uh, they include what financing can be obtained in China and indeed the EU to support my business in the EU or, or China. And uh, Miko will be going through um, some of the models for this uh, later in the presentation. How should the investment be structured in China, China especially for the more restricted areas uh, like the telecommunications area in China? There's certain vehicles that you can set up to uh, access, access the Chinese market. Um, if you take on the investment, how do you retain control over the business? What are the key positions in the company, for example, and what are the uh, contractual clauses that you should be looking for in the investment agreement? Um, are there any differences in the valuation process in China compared with the EU? I think this is a very common question as well. And of course, one of the fundamental questions is how can you actually find the investors in the first place? And uh, Miko will be helping us answer many of these questions throughout the presentation today. The other quick uh, slide that I just wanted to show everybody was this one from the OECD, which shows the history of China's, the history and development of China's innovation policy over the last uh, 40 years. And as you can see on the left, uh, it shows that at the beginning it was very much um, centralized and government led, led with uh, a lot of the, or all of the funding coming from uh, public, public funds. And this has developed over the years to include universities, firms uh, into the mix, and increasingly becoming firm-centric uh, after 2005. And you can see this towards the right side of this diagram. So the, at the same time, if you look at the bottom row, the foreign, the funding instruments and the channels for funding have become more and more relaxed as, as time has gone by. Um, but at the same time, um, they've only been relaxed much more recently, from 2005 onwards. So in terms of venture capital and private equity, um, I think the situation is that we are still very much at the beginning stage as well. And I think that will be something that Miko can detail in a, in a bit more detail as he goes through his presentation. And our presenter, as I mentioned before, who will be leading us through all these questions and telling us a bit about the status of venture capital and private equity in China and how to access these funds is Mr. Miko Pohaga, who's uh, uh, from Finland. Uh, and he has a very deep experience of um, investing in China and doing business in China and in the EU and in the USA. But in the last 10 years, uh, Miko, you've been really focusing on, on the China market and uh, have been successful very recently in a brokering emergers and acquisitions deal in, uh, between the Chinese firm and, and the Finnish company. Uh, you set up a consulting company here and um, you're also very, very well connected with the, the Finnish business environment and the Finnish, Finnish community as well as the EU community uh, as well. So, so Miko, if I can just hand over to you, if you can just take us through you know, uh, your view of accessing finance in, uh, in the China business environment at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think this is uh, quite a lot to cover in, in uh, the 30 minutes plus that I have, but uh, let's see um, how much we can cover. And uh, you're always welcome to send questions to uh, me later on if, if you have some uh, additional questions that you want to be answered, and I will try to get back to you on, on those. But the things that I want to talk about uh, today is uh, I've uh, kind of uh, done like six main points what I want to cover. One, motivations for taking in investments, why to, ta why to consider that, and then three different models that I think uh, cover the different aspects of, of uh, uh, raising money for, from China and, and uh, things related to that. And then some uh, practical advice, especially to the European uh, uh, venture capitalists, who are looking to maybe partner with some of the uh, uh, Chinese players in, in China and to help their portfolio companies also at the same time to access the Chinese market. And then, of course, uh, most importantly, some advice to the uh, SMEs and entrepreneurs that are looking to access that finance and uh, uh, the Chinese market. All right, well, let's get started with the first part. Uh, there's also couple of polls. So um, as I said, we want to make this uh, presentation as interactive. So, um, as I said, we want to make this uh, presentation as interactive as possible. And so we'd like to do that by not talking about first poll. Which is coming up very much and I, when it comes up I'd be ready to question. Which is just here. 
So as you can see, the poll is now open. As you can see, the poll is now open. And the question is, what is your motivation for getting funding in China? Is it to develop my business in China? Is it to develop my business in China? To uh, sustain my business in Europe? Or uh, is it because it's difficult to access funds from anywhere else? So if you could just, so if you could just click uh, on the uh, on the answer on the answer, um, and then we can um, and then we can share the results to everybody. And most people have now um, answered the poll, so let me just share this with everybody. So, as you can see, five percent of the audience are saying they want to develop their business in China. Um, Twenty-three percent are saying to them to develop their business in back in Europe, and thirteen percent are saying that it's because it's difficult to access funds from anywhere else. Are there any, any comments on that, Nico? Well, I'm well, happy, I'm happy, happy, to, happy see to see that, that, that the results. results uh, that's not uh, typically what I, what I hear. Uh, I think that um, most of the companies that uh, initially come to China and start talking about Chinese investments is that uh, they are not really comfortable with the idea of uh, coming to China and, and getting the Chinese investor on board, uh, mainly because of the uh, risks involved, losing control, and, and, and so forth. And this is the same thing that I hear not only from the entrepreneurs but also from the VCs operating in, in Europe that the uh, uh, first uh, kind of a motivation is that they would like to get some uh, money for the operations in EU slash globally and maybe to do some test marketing or exploratory work towards China rather than focusing in, 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 in China. Uh, I think that the, uh, all the investors, whether they are from uh, China or Europe, uh, can be somewhat described by the Chinese proverb that all the cats love fish but fear to wet their paws, meaning that uh, uh, if, if you're looking to access Chinese money, you really should be focusing in being in China and growing and becoming in a close relationship to the investor and together with the investor uh, build a business over here. That makes the Chinese investors much more comfortable in, 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 in making the potential deal. Uh, but this from the uh, companies that I've mostly dealt with is not typically the case, but I'm, I'm glad to see that there's uh, a good group uh, listening to this uh, uh, webinar and, and that have different ideas. All right, let's get into the uh, uh, a bit deeper in, in Chapter 2. But don't, don't worry, we'll skip this poll for now. I think skip this poll for now. I think now that we're going into the flow, um, so we can just uh, carry on going through the models. I think. All right. All, All right. right. So, okay. So, first model, first model I think that is a hot topic, which is basically saying that say, uh, 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 we want to get money from, money from China. 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 This, this is, of course, a very welcome idea by the European governments that think that uh, you know we need money in, in Europe in order to build better businesses in Europe, uh, hire more people, create employment through that and, and so forth. Uh, it's also considered kind of a safe and attractive way for working with the Chinese investors when you have your uh, locally established company in U EU that you know how it works and how it's uh, governed and, and so forth. And that's, that's the view that a lot of the uh, SMEs and, and venture capitalists uh, seem to think. Uh, and in, in, in short, it's true. In, in this way, the EU actors, whether it's the uh, SME or the venture capitalists that's uh, looking to take in the investment to the portfolio company, do retain control and are not exposed to any new risks. And uh, this does take place somewhat. So there are companies that are able to raise money from China into the uh, European based company. So I guess you could say that um, what I've seen in the last one or two years is that uh, there are a number of activities in a kind of a pilot mode 
So both uh, venture capitalists as well as uh, corporations, whether it's private companies or state-owned enterprises, uh, are making some investments into Europe. Uh, and, and maybe this could be also seen as a potential future trend that more and more Chinese investors start making cross-border deals. But you have to remember that this does expose the Chinese investors to risks that they cannot control in their investments, and that makes them very uncomfortable. So the downside could be that uh, instead of you getting, let's say, the uh, one or two million euros that you're looking for at one go, they might be issuing different types of control mechanisms where they release the money bit by bit, let's say, even on a monthly basis, I've seen some of the deals like that taking place, where they really control what happens to the money that they give out. Second model, which I think is it's, it's the most traditional model of, of uh, uh, getting companies coming over to China and, 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 and getting financing, is, uh, is the one that works well for the uh, I would say mostly for the medium-sized and larger companies that have their own funds or can access finance with relative ease. But it doesn't really work too well for SMEs. So companies use their uh, own money to come to China, set up business over here, uh, or manage to convince the VCs that are backing them that, okay, China is the right market play for them. On the other hand, what I've seen, uh, even though the situation is getting better, the European VCs do not yet understand uh, well enough the opportunities that China presents or the risks to be comfortable investing just on the promise of a big market in China for the European Union SMEs. So it's uh, even for the local investors that you might have close by, uh, you need to do similar type of a homework and, and a proof of uh, uh, concept that uh, yes you can access the Chinese market uh, and make good business over here so in, in in some way you can say that you're dealing with the same issue of convincing the people with money uh, as you would do in, in, in China uh, I think that one way uh, that uh, could lead to success in in the future is that if uh, EU and Chinese VCs would establish closer cooperation and, for instance, develop some models to do syndicated deals. As an example, this could work in a sense that uh, uh, you start talking with a local investor in, in Europe and you say that your main focus for the growth is going to be China. And you sell the story that, all right, give me some commitment and you together with the investor will approach then uh, some Chinese investors to help them to fund part of the found, uh, funding round. So you kind of share the risk. So you're sh uh, showing the Chinese uh, investor that, yes, uh, we are getting some money from EU, but we also need money from you so that you are committed in helping us to make a successful business case in, in China. And this would then kind of a, uh, works back to your favor for the EU investor that gets comfort that the Chinese investor wants to make your case successful in, in, uh, in, in China. And I guess there's a uh, way of describing this that you hear way too many times in China that you are developing a win-win for the investors. Sorry, Miko, we just got a question there. Uh, sure. The audience, and it says, uh, it asks, are Chinese investors viewed as being more risk averse than European investors? Um, good question. Um, in, in, uh, in some senses, yes. Uh, historically, the Chinese investors have been going for uh, more mature deals, so like B or C rounds, where, where the company is already established and, and has a track record of uh, successful uh, uh, customers and, and sales and, and, and being able to produce profits as well. So, yes, in that sense, but on the other hand, depending on the sector, uh, especially in uh, like uh, mobile internet deals, they do very high risk deals, but they do them locally. So they don't like to do high risk deals to a faraway company or faraway uh, place 
that uh, potentially can have a big success in China. So they are more comfortable doing high-risk deals in China than in cross-border deals. On the other hand, there's the uh, challenge that uh, uh, the, in, in some ways you could say that the Chinese investors have been spoiled. They've been getting such a good returns in, in China deals that they would like to get the same type of returns out of uh, EU deals or even better ones because there's more risk involved. Uh, there are some statistics that say that uh, the uh, European VCs in the past 20 or so years have uh, basically getting single digit returns on their funds, which is okay in, in, in Europe uh, for the uh, limited partners that the funds have. But in China, it's 30% plus, even though the uh, scope of the time is much more limited. Like Chris pointed out early on, the, the industry is really, really young over here. So, so there's a whole wide range of scope over here. Uh, a lot of uh, mature deals that are kind of conservative, but then also some really high risk plays. All right, next one. All right, um, next one. Um, I think that this is the one that I want to cover the most, in, which is China to China, which is I think that it's the where you can currently, not in the future, do most of the uh, success cases. Um, so there's a Chinese uh, saying that near the rivers we recognize the fish, near to the mountains we recognize the songs of the birds. It's, so in other words, it's very important to make on-the-spot investigations. Uh, this holds true to investors everywhere. Uh, so if you're looking for money in Europe, you're most likely to get it from a European VC. If you're looking for money uh, from the US, you're most likely to get it if you have a, a business over there already. And if you're looking for money from China, you're most likely to get the money then from the Chinese investor. Uh, this is because they, they like to see what you are doing and they like to be, at least in theory, help you to become successful so that their business uh, uh, really flies. Now, on the other hand, it's the same is true for the entrepreneurs. I think it would be a good idea that uh, if you have a presence in China, then it's okay to look at the possibility of taking a Chinese investor on board. If you're in EU, it's kind of a risk that you take in money, let's say from a Beijing uh, VC, that then tries to advise you from Beijing how to do business in, in Europe or to take the first step to China, which can lead to conflicts in, 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 in a lot of cases. I would say that uh, this model where you kind of a try to set yourself to be a local player in China through some structure uh, is probably the best model for EU SMEs and entrepreneurs who are serious about China. And there's also the widest range of options available, uh, ranging from incubators, angel investors, to corporate investors, venture capitalists, and even government funding. So you have a full spectrum of uh, different types of funding structures and funding options available for you. Uh, there are established incubators, uh, also like, like for instance, we have a company called uh, China Accelerator, uh, which is a very, uh, I would say, foreign friendly in a sense that uh, they provide, uh, uh, besides some funding, they also provide uh, training in English so you can uh, feel comfortable making the first step over here as well as number of investors that operate over here locally, uh, whether it's uh, from the VC side or from the co corporate side. But the downside in, 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 in that is that you need to be able to take the first step with your own resources or backing from Europe to come to China and, and, and start working on this model. But I have uh, several more points on, on, on this one, how to do, uh, how to raise fi financing in China uh, so, um, incubators and angels, uh, nowadays there can be a great variety found from Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, 
Hong Kong with various types of offerings uh, and focuses, whether it's uh, money, space, mentoring, uh, you name it. Uh, there's kind of something for everyone, in, in a sense. Uh, but the competition is fierce. I would say that it's very similar to Silicon Valley, uh, which is very different from Europe. In Europe, if, if you're looking to get into an incubator, it's almost just welcome. Show up and, and you are in. But over here, uh, I know that there are the best incubators, they get hundreds of applicants and only a dozen or so e get selected on a, on a yearly basis. Uh, I don't know whether it's that or whether there's some other reason, maybe these are not that well known yet for the European companies, but what I've seen so far, the European companies have been very much underrepresented. Uh, the US companies have found these and are getting good results. So they are coming here even with a very early stage company, uh, getting their business started and are able to attract funding and are building their businesses. Something that uh, I think is uh, very much underused uh, uh, potential investor group uh, or a subgroup is, is corporate investors. SOEs or state-owned enterprises that have uh, very much uh, government-controlled uh, um, targets, I would, for the most part, forget about those. They, they have their own agendas uh, often aligned with, with some of the government policies and, and are kind of hard to figure out, especially if, if you are new to China and the Chinese market. But I would really look for, for finding... Uh, besides venture capitalists to look at the option of, of uh, private owned enterprises. There's a um, number of uh, good sized um, uh, private companies nowadays in, in, in China that have uh, uh, potentially a great value added besides the money as they have greater reach and access to the Chinese market and they're kind of niche players so uh, depending on which area you are, uh, you can find a partner that, uh, at least in theory, can give you access throughout all of China. Uh, and, and they have the sales force, they have offices, they have everything if you have the right type of a, a product that uh, can be uh, put through these channels. Uh, the downside is that uh, a lot of these corporations are... Uh, kind of like amateurish in, in their investments rather than professional ones, uh, which makes the deal making more of an art than science uh, with very few established rules, even though I have to say that they are very quickly getting more sophisticated. So what I, what I mean by that is that uh, you might find a company that uh, has, uh, you know, it's a market leader in China. Uh, and they stated out loud that they want to make investments into European companies. Then you get to, to meet the right people over there. You have the right type of access to the company. And then you try to start negotiating the deal. And you are pretty much starting with a blank, space, uh, blank page. There's nothing in place. No processes, uh, nothing. So you kind of have to take as a... Uh, potential investment target, the role of, of advising and helping the company to make the deal, which can take then, then take a lot of time and, and effort and money to get it done. That actually comes one of the questions that um, I've learned from the presentation, um, presentation about aggregation as well. Mm -hmm. um, what are the perspectives from the Chinese investors perspective of how they would value an investment from the company? Um, um, Again, Again uh, it, uh, it depends, depends on the industry. If you are, if you are in a hot in area, 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 mobile, mobile internet, 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 or computing, or, or, or internet of the internet things. Of the things. things. For, those, For those, uh, uh valuations can be crazy, crazy, crazy. Like US type, US type. But, but if you're talking in a, in a, in a, in a more of a conservative, of a conservative industry, industry, or something or that's something not in a period now, 
Here then right now, evaluation, then evaluations uh, uh, are much more, uh, are much more conservative than Europe. Chinese investors, Chinese investors are, saying, are, saying, especially the, uh, the, uh, are saying that they're looking to make a risk investment. Then they want to see your cash flow and balance sheet and, and, and uh, income statement and saying, that, okay, well, how much profits you actually make? And you're like, well, I'm not making any money. I'm looking to grow. And that's not what they want to hear. They want to see that you are good at business. They want to see that you're able to produce good profits. And then they want you to help to grow to make even more profits, uh, which is very different from, especially from the U.S., but also, also from Europe. Um, venture capitalists as a whole, um, you know, anyone that uh, has dealt with, with China uh, for any period of time knows that uh, getting uh, good statistics out of China uh, is uh, next to impossible. But, but you can say it's, it's a young industry. Uh, looking at some official statistics from uh, last year, which was a record year for the Chinese venture capital industry, uh, indicate that it's about the same size as that of Europe's, but it's growing fast. Uh, and like I said all, earlier, there's, so far there's been so many low-hanging fruits that have provided them with bigger re returns than the uh, European counterparts that it's, uh, uh, it's been kind of an easy game for, for, for them in, in that sense. So they are not really that sophisticated. So what you have in, in China is a wide spectrum of players uh, ranging from pure opportunities that uh, will look at any possible deal, uh, no matter what the industry, uh, with the funds that they have available, uh, with a very little understanding of the VC industry, to on the other side, very sophisticated investors that who have modeled their working styles from the USA. So, so you have kind of the boat, boat uh, players over here. Uh, but uh, it's in, in in some ways, I, I think you can say that it's uh, the Chinese VC industry is a bit like adolescent, you know, very eager, looking to do big things, uh, doesn't have much fear in a lot of things, but on the other hand, doesn't have much confidence uh, as to what they are really doing, and they keep making a lot of mistakes on the other side. Uh, some of the uh, advice that I would like to uh, give out to uh, uh, European-based uh, VCs is that uh, they, they have a number of uh, things that they could be, and I think they should be doing in, in, in China. Uh, one possibility would be that they could increase the size of their funds uh, by inviting Chinese investors as LPs uh, into them. Uh, but uh, like uh, noted the, in, in, in one recent survey, Chinese LP might be challenging to work with. Uh, so money should not be the only consideration of having a Chinese uh, investor on board also for, for the VCs. Uh, what that means in, in practice, when, whereas in, in, in Europe we, the uh, funds are very well governed. There's uh, very transparent corporate, corporate governance as to who invests where, how are the different LPs treated, how are the portfolio companies treated and so forth. In, in China it's, it's, it's a young industry so there are few rules and there are always exceptions even among the LPs within the same fund, which, which really makes them hard to manage. Uh, another option that uh, the Chinese companies are very comfortable uh, is, is uh, uh, M&A. They like to buy companies that uh, they think that they could grow in China so, and they can control. So an exit to, to our, out of our portfolio companies is something that uh, I would say that all the VCs uh, should take into consideration when, when thinking of China. Even if you forget about everything else in, in China, uh, you should look at China as a possible uh, exit target. Uh, third one that I, I also already mentioned uh, earlier is that, um, that uh, 
both U.S. and uh, re more recently the Israelis have had a lot of success with this is uh, uh, doing syndicated deals with the Chinese venture capitalists, uh, which basically mean that the Chinese VCs would take a uh, more active role in the growth rounds when China is becoming relevant for the company. And, and there's already been a number of successful cases between U.S. and, and China. And, and some of the cases are, they're, they're big companies. So, so the main motivation is, is not really the money, but it's access to, like Chris said earlier, to maybe a like, restricted market that they wouldn't be able to access otherwise. For instance, just over a year ago, uh, a Chinese VC uh, invested into uh, the Amazon Web Services set up in China. Amazon Web Services was banned out of China for a number of years, years. And of course, if you look at Amazon, they would have enough money on their own, but they didn't have access. So they actually had to partner with a Chinese VC to get the exposure and access to the Chinese market. So I think that number of uh, uh, European VCs might and should take a look in the way the US VCs have uh, succeeded in, in that. And the Israelis kind of followed the same model and, and got li really a good traction in, in just a couple of years. What, what are the actual um, US VCs or the Israeli VCs strong players when they approach the market compared to the European VCs? Uh, well, they've been here. So, uh, for instance, the uh, U US VCs, uh, if you look at the uh, bigger players in, uh, in, in China, like Baidu, for instance, Baidu raised money from, uh, from Silicon Valley and from a US investor. And, and so have a number of other kind of uh, very growth and uh, global oriented Chinese companies have done, done the same. So through that, there's natural connection to the U.S. And on the other hand, there's also so many Chinese students that have gone to U.S. So that, and then come back uh, with, with businesses to China and have established their players. And now they're going through their second or third startup and some of them are getting the funds and, and so forth. So, so the ecosystem is, is in, in place there. In uh, Europe, well, we've had a number of Chinese students go to Europe and so forth, but for, for different reasons. So there hasn't been that strong of a uh, kind of a money and, and business oriented uh, thinking in, in going into Europe as it has been in, in, in the US. The, what the Israelis did uh, well in, in, in my perspective was that they took kind of this VC's first angle in, in talking to Chinese. Uh, the activities I've seen from Europe is that typically you get a delegation of uh, SMEs and have them talk to VC's. Now talking to VC's even if you're in Europe as a startup and if you haven't done that before is, is tough. Uh, and then he, when you're in China, it's even tougher. So, so you're basically begging for money uh, from someone that does see, sees like tons of companies all the time. So, so the discussion is not, uh, and the dialogue is not among equals, uh, which is, is very important in, in the Asian and Chinese culture. Uh, if you have a VC showcasing his or her portfolio companies, it's then the dialogue is between two investors, so between two equals. So it makes a much more productive discussion in, in, in that sense. Um, I, I think that Europe does have its own strong points that should be emphasized. Uh, well, even, even if it's just that the, uh, uh, with the current uh, uh, situation in Europe, uh, EU has taken a much more friendly attitude towards Chinese investments. And, and working with the Chinese. And uh, I think that also the, the way Europe presents, present themselves is, is better suited for the Chinese. U.S. kind of like to come over here and, and tell, okay, this is how it works, like it or not. Europeans have maybe a more humble approach and, and that, that seems to work well for the Chinese. So, so you can establish the dialogue, but then you have to be kind of be able to overtake that to the next level 
and create the create the big story that the U.S. are so good at to make the uh, cases appealing to the uh, Chinese. But that's for the venture capitalist. For the SMEs, there's a number of things that you have to do in order to really uh, be successful over here and, and uh, be able to raise uh, financing if you, if you want to do that. You really need to define your China strategy. Uh, you must show real understanding of the business environment in China and I would strongly urge that you should have proof of that through pilot customers so that you show that you not only know that there's a big market for, potentially for your products but you know how to localize them for the Chinese environment and that you can access the customers and you can get money from that them. Again, a big issue, protect your IPR in any way you can locally according to local laws, but uh, not EU SME Center, but the IPR help desk can, can help, help you in, 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 in that. Um, then you should define what is your best access point to China, the right customers, and uh, then think really hard how do you scale up your business potentially to meet the investors expectations like I said they're looking for a big story they're not looking for you to build your business from 1 million to 10 but rather from 1 million to 100 million or 1 from you know, 1 million to a billion at least in theory that that's what they want to hear and that's the kind of companies they want to back so, like I said, they are used to very high returns, and that's what they wanna wanna find. Uh, and I think then then also you should define before you start uh, approaching and talking to the investors is that you you think about what type of investors can help you reach your goals. So whether it's the uh, private owned enterprises, corporations that can act, give you access to customers or whether it's a VC that has some access to uh, maybe some channels or some key partner or whether it's something else. Maybe you're better off with some uh, business angel, whether it's an expat or a local one that uh, you feel comfortable with uh, dealing with for the next uh, X years because the uh, partnerships are, are uh, for a longer period of time. And I think that one of the ways to get really started uh, is that uh, uh, you should send a key executive, not just some junior person from your company to China, at least for three to six months, to validate your plans, to establish connections and uh, possible justification for investments into China. Because uh, the most likely uh, way... Uh, of accessing Chinese investor will mean that initially you have to finance the first step to your company's existing funds or the uh, investor you have uh, behind you, which is something I also pointed out earlier. But so, so getting money from China means that you first have to kind of a, more or less in all of the cases invest yourself at first. Um, also once you've done that, then you should um, prepare, just like in any market, a long list of potential investors. You can find these from various sources. I know that EU SME Center has uh, uh, connections, uh, all the local uh, business councils, uh, chambers, of, chambers of commerce, and so forth. They have uh, lists of potential investors. Then you can also uh, look at some of the uh, very recent uh, <coughs> venture capital associations have been formed in at least in some of the bigger cities like Beijing or Shanghai, Hong Kong and, and so forth. So you can get a, a lot of a list of potential investors. Now that's still cold calling. Once you've identified the type of investors that you want to get on board, uh, I would suggest that you try to find someone that knows them and get a trusted party's introduction. Uh, that's, that's the same for every market, but even more so in, in, in China. 
for getting the negotiation started, um, I would say, even though I'm a consultant, so uh, use a consultant or lawyer or both that have done this in China before and have references to back that up. It's not easy. Nothing is a done deal until you have money in the bank. True. This is true everywhere, but even more so in, in, in China. I've seen uh, deals that, uh, you know, all the contracts have been made, signed, and then companies are just waiting for the money to show up in the account, and it never does. Uh, Timing-wise, depending on how ready you are, uh, the process takes 6 to 18 months and quite a bit of investment, like I said, to cover the invest, uh, to get the investment from, um, uh, and, and the money that, where it goes, it's time from the management and fees to the outside uh, uh, help. And I think that uh, something that actually applies two ways, that you should remember the golden rule, which is something that I read in, in, in one book, that the golden rule states that, that the one with the gold makes the rules. Uh, so if all the key cards are in the investor's hand, then they make the rules. But if you have a really good case, you protected your IP, you have a great story, then you are the one that uh, holds the uh, gold and, and you get better terms with, from the investor. Um, to wrap up, there's a lot of money in China. Uh, during the uh, uh, APEC conference uh, late last year, uh, the uh, president stated that in the next 10 years, uh, China will invest 1.25 trillion USD abroad. Hopefully some of that will go to Europe. Uh, some of that will go to VC funds. Uh, there's, there's been um, uh, announcement on new type of uh, fund of funds in China that are huge and at some point that money will start flowing downwards to uh, companies and hopefully also the European companies but you should aim to have a presence in China before really starting to talk with serious investors. The Chinese investment ecosystem is still going through adolescence in bad and good. Uh, I think that the uh, bad part is that they don't always know what they're doing, not really. Uh, the good thing is that uh, they don't have uh, as much fear and uh, are more open to ideas than, than some European investors might be. So if you're good at negotiations, they can be quite flexible if you can find terms that meet, uh, meet their needs. So I know that uh, the SME Center has some kind of a test kit to uh, test yourself that whether you're ready for China, uh, I think that you should also be asking yourself, are you ready for the Chinese investment? Since there's, there's uh, challenges not in, only in getting that, but also then in, in managing that. Thank you very much for the presentation and for mentioning your salty kit. Muted. Thank you for mentioning your salty kit, which um, covers the fundamental questions of um, doing business in China. And it also includes a questionnaire where you can test yourself in you are prepared for the China market. And you can that questionnaire and our starter kit, um, which is a uh, free for download uh, from the USB Center website. And we've got a few questions here, um, and so I'd like to keep up by asking one or two. Um, you mentioned on this last slide, for example, that there's a lot of money in China, but really, how much of this is accessible to smaller companies? Unmuted. Um, is there a price against SMEs, and how would they access? Well, well, like I said, I think that you should come over and look and feel local, then, then, then you have a great spectrum available for you. Uh, uh, some of it's uh, relatively easy to identify where you can find the, the money. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, uh, ways to network over here. Big, bigger cities are great. Something is happening every day. You just start networking and meeting people and saying that looking for investments. Uh, we are seeing over in, uh, in, in China, in most of the big cities, that you have uh, foreign entrepreneurs that are now doing their second or third uh, company in, in China. So, um, so, the, um, so just by 
networking over here, you can access a uh, lo lot of lot of uh, people and investors through 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 that. You did. Quick to spot innovation from Google. Is that one of the drivers? Yeah, but the, yeah. the thing well, is that, the, uh, that uh, I think that you should remember that uh, uh, it's a uh, global view. Uh, global so, view. so, for instance, if so you are in the something something mobile internet related, mobile they, they will at least try to look try everywhere. everywhere. So, there's, so there's, in, in some cases, there might be some they have connections and so forth, they are trying to take a top of you, find the best of the best. Um, um, well, um, the, well, the easiest way is not to take any way. So when you are in control, when you are in control, any investment, any investment, not risky. But uh, I think that the key thing that you should try to protect is, is your IP. Uh, then if you are already a already uh, established business outside of China, China. Outside of China. maybe it's possible maybe. to separate that from, from the China side. It's, it's not always possible not always that they want to kind of get a piece of the whole whole, whole thing, but it could be another another way. It is a Well, um, well, um, uh, uh, Especially uh, when you're dealing with the most sophisticated investors, it's uh, uh, they have money for really they have money for so they know how to protect their own interests. They can also, uh, in, especially in China, they can have other ways of working the system. Uh, if they want to get uh, their, if they want to get their trip in in managing your country, in, in managing your country, they both do well. The do instruments such as um, or elements in, in the agreement such as preferred products, products that would that we do the same kind of mentality in China. Well you, you well you can try. Well you can try. I mean uh well, I mean, said in uh quite 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 so so they are not gonna they are not gonna lot of the investors so might the investors uh, 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 are saying that are uh, you trying to be cheap I mean so 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 you so, so you can spend some time getting getting as comfortable as you can as as you as you can. thinking about it. It's, it's thinking about it. it's, it's marriage I want to enter it so that it doesn't end up so in a nasty, nasty divorce, divorce uh, where, uh, where you lose everything. You lose everything. So, so it is, so, so it is so do your due diligence, your due diligence the investor. The investor. So don't be so just happy that they won't be there. Do your, do your due diligence. How do you work with the How companies with the before? before. Uh, maybe call up maybe call companies that they uh, work, work with and get feedback from them. From them. From them. Okay, that, okay, that how did these guys how react, these guys react, react when, when were tough? Things were tough. Investors, Investors I mean, they let they you control, control as long as long as long as go as planned. Plan, 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 plan. When things were difficult, then my company my idea your solution might be give more money more money without they might want to their control which is which is now replacing the management you may be using your shareholding and not not even not even that one of the key questions that was asked by a lot of the audience members um was one of the things and that's where do you find the investors are there the platforms or Forums, the fora that um, you can find. Um, um, yes and yes no. And no. So, so like I said, like there, there are associations, associations and 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 events and, 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 and so 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 find hundreds and hundreds, 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 hundreds of potential investors. investors. Uh, and uh, and then spend the next two or three years to get all of them, which might might and might not might not be investment company. I would somehow. Talking to Talking more, more, more of, uh, uh, that, uh, that um, you become friendly. You become friendly. If, if the investor is good, in in a sense that I consider a good investor, uh, he will then tell you right away that all right, this is not for me. But by the way, I know 
few companies that might be interested in the type of investment opportunity that you're presenting over here and then he or she will open up the door for you and that's then you're getting a trusted introduction and and you get straight into the proper type of discussions about the potential investment and then you kind of start working that through so you go from intro, true introductions rather than looking at big lists of, of, of potential investors just, just as last question you mentioned that you, know, you, you have this uh, you did you have this um, thing of a good investor in China what's, what's on your checklist when you, when you unmuted um, well A that they really have money uh, there are investors that uh, actually don't have money, uh, which is, they're more like a um, consultants or, or some kind of advisors. Uh, in, in China, it's, you, some of them call themselves investors, even though they're not really. Not so check whether they actually have money. Check whether they have uh, made uh, enough deals beforehand uh so that you can kind of establish what their track record is is in in making investments well so in some cases the best investor might be doing its first investment investment with your case but if you're looking to approach it systematically then i would check their track record so first check whether they have money be their track record um and then thirdly you must define a joint plan as to how to take the company forward uh, so so that you know that you agree on the goals so that you don't have different ideas that you, and you only find out about the different goals after you've taken the investment on board but then it gets off to a wrong start right from the beginning okay. so make sure there's that strategic yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. that's great thank you very very much Nico, for hmm. that very insightful presentation and a very insightful presentation and the answering of those questions right. Muted. I'd just like to um, finish off by reminding everybody of some of the documentation that the ESNE Center has that can uh, help you in some of the upcoming events that we have too. Um, Miko has mentioned carrying out your due diligence and making sure that you know the background of your partner, making sure they've got the cash. Um, and one of the reports that can help you, um, which is free from download, for download from the ESNE Center website, is uh, called Knowing Your Partners in China. And it's part of our starter kit. And uh, Miko mentioned that before as well. We also have some uh, training coming up, technical training. And uh, there'll be one on e-commerce, which is a, a very hot area at the moment in China, as I'm sure everybody knows. That'll be taking place in Frankfurt in April the 28th. And then we have our first export of food and beverages products to China uh, workshop, which will be taking place in Brussels on May the 6th. Uh, and then we have some skills training, uh, which we cover in leadership training and developing a, a global mindset, so uh, cultural communication training as well. And that will be taking place on May the 11th and May the 29th in Beijing. So. Uh, if you're interested in that, please look on our website and you can sign up uh, there as well. The last thing I wanted to mention is that we are carrying out a survey at the moment of the, the key challenges that uh, SMEs are facing when they're entering the China market. Access to finance is obviously one of them. Um, and it would be very good if you could um, help us by encouraging uh, your SMEs or yourself to um, fill up that survey for us. And that will give us a much more detailed view of the, the different uh, issues that people are facing when they're doing business in China. And you can get that survey. Um, Erica is sending that around right now through the link through the window. Okay. So it just leaves me to say thank you very, very much, Nico, for that extremely interesting uh, presentation. The other thing is if, if anybody wants to ask any further questions, um, you can uh, send it through to our email address and we'll pass them on to Nico. And or they can be answered by our experts at the ESME Center. Don't forget we have legal advice at the ESME Center that can answer questions on accessing finance in the Chinese business environment. So that's all for today. It's five o'clock. I want to thank you again and thank you, Erica, for doing the production management today, and thank you everybody for joining us. And until the next webinar. Thank you very much. Good night. Unmuted.